Okay, thank you very much, Shidon. Uh, I'm Nobru Notomi, and uh, we are uh, after midnight uh, in Japan, not on Wednesday, but Thursday morning. <laughs> so, so I can't speak loud, uh, but I, I hope you can hear me. <clears throat> and uh, well, I'm very happy to uh, discuss uh, online uh, some of my recent ideas uh, with you uh, in all over the world. So uh, I, uh, I sent her the, the organizer a uh, three-page handout uh, in which I listed uh, and the, 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 the sections of my um, talk and some text, uh, on, only a few texts uh, which I uh, <coughs> discuss. Okay, uh, the, the title of my talk is Socrates Among so the Sophists, Reconsidering His Position in the 5th Century BC. The, uh, section one, who is Socrates? The purpose of my talk is to reconsider the position of Socrates in the history of Greek philosophy. I will suggest that we should distinguish between his position given in the later generations and the position that he occupied in his own time. My aim is to recover the latter by clarifying our conception formed by the former. My central question is, who is Socrates? Socrates is one of the greatest philosophers who influenced and founded the history of philosophy. But is there anything special about him? You may consider two points. First, Socrates has long seen as the turning point of the history of philosophy, as Cicero insists in two scrum disputations, text one. He said, Socrates was the first one who brought down philosophy from the heavens, established it in cities, introduced it into families, and forced it to examine life and morals and good and evil. You may think that this is special. Next, Socrates wrote nothing, as different from Plato, Aristotle, and other great philosophers. This may seem special. Let us consider the second point first. Socrates is not special. There were several philosophers who left no writings to us. In the Greek philosophy before the fourth century BC, we find Thales, Pythagoras, and Diogenes of Sinope. Uh, we have no works or citation from these thinkers. Many assume that they may not have written any books, or even if they wrote, their writings were not transmitted or had little influence on the later tradition. In this sense, Socrates is no, not unique. We know that the absence of his own writings have raised a huge controversy over the philosophy of so philosoph Socrates, but this is not different from the case of Pythagoras, whose contributions were a focus of scholarly discussion, whether he's an original scientist and philosopher or a shamanistic religious leader, according to Walter Burkert. Pythagoras left no writings, but later tradition added many materials. Similarly, our information of Socrates came from the Socratic literature and other indirect sources, which may contain many fictions. The case of Diogenes of Sinope is more obvious. His thought and life are known from Diogenes Laotius and in other later sources. We can learn from these examples that reconstruction is possible for one's life and thought without his or her own writings. And Socrates was no exception. We just need skills in dealing with various sources of Socrates. Compared with Pythagoras and Diogenes, we have better accessibility to Socrates, I hope. The lives and teachings of Pythagoras were composed much later by Neo-Pythagorean and Neoplatonist thinkers. Hundreds of anecdotes. Uh, Crea of Diogenes are contaminated with the later cynic and stoic ideas. Indeed, thinkers' testimonies are more confused, and it is extremely difficult to discover the original position in the objective way. Socrates may be more akin to Puro. Ancient skeptics deliberately kept away from writing, but their pupils left their memories. As for Socrates, we are in a better position. We can add, uh, uh, we can and should distinguish three groups of testimonies. First, we have several references to him in the fifth century BC when he was alive. Most of them are in comedies, mocking this strange thinker. Second, 
numerous works were written featuring Socrates or about Socrates. Most of them are Socratic dialogues written by his pupils in order to defend him, including Plato's. But also we know about works against Socrates, like Polycrates' accusation of Socrates, whose critical argument can be partly reconstructed from Xenophon and Libanius. In the second stage, I mean the early 4th century BC, works on Socrates were written by those who knew him and his time. The writers of the third stage after the mid 4th century BC, however, spoke about him without acquaintance. Aristotle commented on Socrates' contribution to philosophy in several places, and Aristoxenos of Tarentum reproached him in the life of Socrates. Much later, writers like Epictetus, in admiration of Socrates' life, spoke on him based on the Socratic literature. We should distinguish these three stages and examine the testimonies with an understanding of each particular group, both in terms of values and bias. Section two, Socrates in the Sophistic Movement. Coming back to the second point that makes us believe Socrates is special. Socrates used to be regarded as the starting point of authentic philosophy. And on this view, the natural philosophers and the sophists are called pre-Socratics. It is repeatedly been noted, it has uh, re uh, repeatedly been noted that the designation pre-Socratics or for Socratic, for Socratic is inappropriate, but it is used customarily still today. But finally, uh, we, uh, the, the new source book of Andre Lux and Graham Most, uh, this volume, uh, I saw the, the face of Andre. <laughs> I'm very uh, happy and uh, I'm very glad to, uh, to discuss uh, his book. Uh, the early Greek philosophies, uh, nine volumes in total. Uh, the eight volumes locate Socrates in the third chapter of the Sophists and changed our location of him in the history. Lux and Most include 11 thinkers in the two volumes of Sophists. I uh, have a list uh, in the uh, handout from Gorgias. I must confess that I'm not entirely satisfied with this new arrangement. The chapter order is a revision of Deal's clans I listed uh, below. Uh, okay, omission of Critias is appropriate uh, because he was not a sophist in any definition, but later included in the list after Philostratos lives of sophist. But two minor sophists, Bucophron, contemporary with Plato, and Xeniades, date uncertain, are misplaced, I think, and the order should become more consistent if we exclude them from the fifth century sophist. The fourth century sophists include Polycrates, Alcidamas, and Isocrates, among many. My main disagree disagreement with uh, Lux and Most is the location of Antiphon in relation to Socrates. Lux Most shows more sympathy with the recent trend of seeing a single Antiphon, then why does not come does he not come before Socrates? My suggested order is Protagoras, Gorgias, Antiphon, and Socrates, so on. Uh, well, in, in this order, Socrates is placed in the fourth in the sophistic movement in the supposed order of their birth. However, it does not necessarily mean that Socrates was a sophist. We need a more careful treatment of these thinkers. As I suggested, we need a clear distinction between the first two stages of Socratic sources, before and after his death in 399. Views are radically different in these two stages. Section three, the dissociation by Plato in the fourth century BC. It was Plato who first made a sharp distinction and contrast between the philosopher Socrates and sophists. It was his invention in the first half of the fourth century BC. The context of the invention was a controversy about, over his trial. We know that the sophist Polycrates published a pamphlet entitled Accusation of Socrates, sometimes around 393 BC, in which Anitos, the speaker, claimed that Socrates was guilty of political and educational crimes. 
Against this revived criticism, the people of Socrates wrote a number of Socratic dialogues. By depicting Socrates' conversation with people, the Socratic writers tried to demonstrate that he was good and that the execution was wrong, as Xenophon's memorabilia. This new movement of the Socratic literature changed the literary context of discussing Socrates. First, the implicit focus of these writings was a controversy of how to assess Socrates' life and activity. Second, pupils competed with each other and provided different views of Socrates, often accompanied by tacit criticism of the other views. For example, we can see in two chapters of the memorabilia, Socrates censoring Aristippus for his way of life. Xenophon was more sympathetic with Antistenes, whose emphasis on labor and autonomy. In this way, each pupil of Socrates advocate his own position and views on Socrates in rivalry with the others. I have discussed this point in my paper uh, entitled Socrates versus Sophist Plato's Invention in Socratica 2008, uh, edited by Libby Rosesti and Alessandro Stavro. Uh, in that paper, I examined the relevant texts and showed that the other people of Socrates than Plato scarcely cared about the distinction between philosopher and sophist. They did not characterize Socrates in terms of philosophy, nor did they deny that they themselves were sophist or under their influence. Socrates was unique, uh, sorry, Plato was unique in making Socrates philosopher. This main strategy of Plato was to dissociate between philosopher and sophist, and to present Socrates as the philosopher, model philosopher, and to confront him with the other intellectuals, mainly the sophists. The dissociation is clearest in the uh, Apology of Socrates by Plato. Socrates insists that he is not a sophist who takes feeds for teaching, he is not a natural thinker like Anaxagoras and he is not the wise, namely the god. In several dialogues, Plato depicts Socrates arguing against the sophists, namely Protagoras, Gorgias, Polos, Prodicus, Hippias, Trashmarchus, Eudemus, uh, Eudemus, and Dionysodorus. From his dialogues, we came to assume that Socrates was the philosopher, in sharp contrast with those sophists as fake philosophers. However, Socrates was not, not clearly distinguished from the other sophists in his lifetime, and people treated them together as intellectuals or wise men. We can observe this feature even in the early 4th century BC. Plato's rivals did not consider any distinction between these, but rather denied that both philosophy and sophistry are incompatible, not to say opposite. Look at the situation briefly. Aristippus and Ischinis, two of Socrates' pupils, were sophists, namely professional teachers of rhetoric, who took feeds for teaching. One anecdote, anecdote in Diodes Laetius shows that when Aristo, uh, Aristippus was condemned for taking money, he answered that Socrates did similar things. Ischinis learned rhetoric from Gorgias and earned money by speech writing and teaching rhetoric. It must have been natural for Aristippus visitor from Kyrene and poor Ischinus to earn money by their teaching activities. Both of them were called sophist by Aristotle, Lucius, and others. Antistinus was a pupil of both Socrates and Gorgias. Diogenes Laetius explained his career as if he converted from Gorgias rhetoric to Socratic philosophy, but clearly it was wrong. Antistinus was associated with Socrates from his youth before Gorgias visited Athens and affected Athenian people in 427. And in his later writings, right, writings Antistinus kept characteristics of both Gorgianic rhetoric and Socratic philosophy. Plato's contemporary teachers of rhetoric, namely Alcidamas and Isocrates, never cared about this distinction either. 
but they are proud of both uh, being both philosopher and sophist. Therefore, it is anachronism to treat Socrates in his lifetime as philosopher, as distinct from sophist, non-philosopher. In the following argument concerning the 5th century BC, I use the words sophist and philosopher in a general sense, not as contrary or incompatible concepts. So section four, Socrates in the 5th century BC. By keeping distance from Plato's view, which eventually became our modern conception, we can see Socrates as one of the representative intellectuals in the fifth century BC who shared activities and thought with many others. Rivalry and debate between them advanced philosophical thought in many respects. I will discuss both common and different features of the sophist and Socrates and try to detect some characteristics that led Plato to believe that Socrates was special. Before looking at Socrates in his own context, a few words about the source for use. As I suggested above, our station of Socrates' source is not particularly bad in comparison with several other cases. In addition to the careful use of the testimony uh, from the three different stages, in particular Attic comedies in the first stage and the Socratic literature, including Plato in the second stage, we should widen our perspective to encompass various intellectual activities to locate him in his own context. We have a good amount of information about the sophists. To reconsider Socrates in the fifth century, we should relate him with his contemporary sophists. Um, I must say that uh, Lux and the most uh, chapter on Socrates, about 120 pages, uh, uh, needs some improvement. Uh, it's not long enough uh, in any way. The range of collected testimony is not wide enough uh, compared with Gian Antony's SSR, of course, to include passage from other people than Plato and Xenophon. Considering the basic difference of the three stages, I would suggest that the sources of Socrates should be arranged uh, more uh, with a chronological uh, awareness uh, than just a topical division. I believe that it will be an interesting and uh, important job for us scholars of Socratic studies to consider what testimonies are included in such a chapter as Lux in Moscow. Now let us examine the sophist and Socrates, how they are common and uh, different. I will examine five points. So the uh, five points in the handwork. The first point is place of activity, democratic Athens. Are there any common features between Socrates and his contemporary thinkers, in particular sophists? First, the time and place where they are active characterize their common activities. In the, later uh, uh, the latter half of the fifth century BC, Athens was a center of Greek culture, economy, and politics. There, Democritus was established under Pericles leadership. Intellectuals from different parts of Greece came to stay in Athens for various reasons. For example, Hippocrates of Chios, not Kos, Chios, leading mathematician, stayed in Athens while involved in litigation between 450 to 430. Anaxagoras lived in Athens for 20 years and associated with Pericles. His pupil and the natural philosopher Archelaus came to Athens and met the young Socrates in 452. Democritus reported that he had visited Athens and seen Socrates while nobody, including Socrates, recognized him. These examples indicate that Athens was a central uh, cultural center where scientists and philosophers gathered and exchanged ideas. Socrates was a local thinker and never left the city except for, for the war. Sophists were central figures. Protagoras started the profession of sophist around 455 and uh, often came to Athens to give lectures. Gorgias made his debut in the Athenian assembly in 427 when he was sent by his city, Leontine. Since then, he had a great influence on Athenian people. As a sophist, major and minor stayed in Athens to teach wisdom to his pup their pupils, of whom many were Athenians, but some followers from different cities. 
as we can see in Plato's Protagoras. They influenced Athenian intellectuals such as Pericles, Euripides, Thucydides, Alcibiades, and Critias. From Plato's dialogues in particular, uh, in particular Protagoras and Gorgias, we know the lively atmosphere of this period so as to imagine what role Socrates played in his lifetime. He enjoyed not only antagonistic dialogue with the formidable sophist, but also interaction and social conversations. He learned and taught in a wider sense, people in Athens and from outside. The characters appearing play at Plato's symposium have different occupations and background, doctor, poet, etc. and Socrates himself was a sculptor. Second point is art of speaking, logos. Both Sophist and Socrates engaged in speaking, they gained logos. They spoke in front of a large or small audience and held dialogues, dialogista, in public or in private. We can understand this feature better if we compare it with the philosophical activities of the earlier natural philosophers. For they did not seem to have a common place or exchange their ideas face to face. For example, we hear no episode of Socrates conversing with or listening to Anaxagoras, who was staying in Athens when he was uh, young. I pre presume that he scarcely gave uh, uh, Anaxagoras uh, scarcely gave public speech or discussion, though his thoughts were published and read in book. By contrast, the sophist engaged in speaking in public and professed to teach skills in public speech. They gave priority to speaking in contrast to writing. Although we know that Protagoras wrote some treatises, tools and on God, in addition to a dozen of titles reported in Dionysius and Iosius, we do not know many other writings of the sophist. They are proud of extempore speeches, but not so interested in treatises or theoretical works. They produced the writings only for some particular purposes. Two epidics works of Gorgias, Encomium Helen and Defense of Paramedes, aimed to demonstrate his skills in rhetoric, probably to recruit his pupils. Prodicus, Choice of Heracles, and Hippias, Troian Dialogue, were text for recital. The most notable examples is Antiphon's Tetralogies, which he probably used to display a variety of rhetorical argument for education. Therefore, these writings are subsidiary teaching materials rather than main achievement of their profession. In the light of this oral tradition, Socrates was not special when he produced no writing. He engaged in speaking, and discussing various topics with his fellow citizens and foreign guests, just as the sophists. Socrates engaged in dialogue, which is often contrasted to long speech given by the sophist. It is true that whereas Protagoras, Gorgias, Antiphon, and others focus on forensic speeches, not all the sophists are always inter interested in this genre. Hippias and Prodicus seem to be better at political speeches, but in this aspect, Socrates was, unlike other sophists, uninterested in speaking in court or assembly. Socrates developed his skills in speaking in the form of dialogue, but this was also part of the sophist repertoire. Some sophists, like Eutydemus and Dionysodorus in Plato's dialogue, are good at questions and answers. Instead of giving a long one-sided speech, the cross-examination through questioning a particular form of dialogue was developed into the method of elenchos, refutation. We know from Aristotle's sophisticated sophistical refutations, that refutation, elenchos, used by sophists often entails fallacies. In this respect, both Socrates and some sophists share the same form of argumentation. Plato formalized the art of dialectic, dialectique, from dialogue and elenchos exercised by Socrates. But as far as dialectic is practiced by two parties, namely questioner and answerer, to attack and defend one thesis, it was clearly developed from Protagoras' art of antilogy, antilogique, namely discussing both sides. 
which itself originated in Zeno's Eleatic argument. Considering this wide context, we see Socratic Elenkos or Platonic dialectic not as purely original, but as based on the sophisticated art of speech and argumentation. Here, it is important that both Sophists and Socrates focus on Logos and discuss the art of Logos. As Edward Schapper once demonstrated, in the 5th century BC, the technical term rhetorique was prob probably not used by the Sophists, but they called their own skills techne logo, art of speeches. This designation is vague enough to embrace logical arguments and rhetorical speeches, of which both Socrates and other Sophists are experts. This is why Socrates was warned to be a formidable speaker. Deinos Legain, along with the other sophists. It is Plato and Aristotle who clearly distinguish between rhetoric and logic, and between fallacies and valid arguments. Before this, they were all regarded as experts in speech, namely practitioners and teachers of techne logo. Socrates talked to his friend he meets on, every, uh, on any topic without preparation. This looked like extemporary speech that Gorgias has entertained with his art of speeches. Time, place, and occasion are most important elements for sophist speaking skills, in particular detecting and controlling kairos timing. Socrates talked to each person on a variety of appropriate topics and tailors his speech to the situation. Socrates' dialogue had a lot in common with the art of speech that so sophists claim to have and teach. The third point, virtue, soul, and love. What did they speak about? Protagoras and other profess to teach virtue. Socrates probably never claimed to teach others, but nevertheless, he always encouraged others through dialogue to care for the soul. It means to care for virtue. So a central concern for both Sophist and Socrates was virtue, arete. Now we must admit that Socrates was not the first philosopher who discussed moral issues, contra Cicero, text one. We see that Sophist and Socrates share the new interest in ethics in this period. Socrates encourages his interlocutors to care for the soul, pushuke. Although the word pushuke has much changed uh, since uh, uh, Homer's epic, but it was not Socrates alone who changed its meaning. In his praise of the power of Logos, Gorgias discussed soul as the object of influence and manipulation in the encomium of Helen. Thus, Plato characterized rhetoric as pushukago game, or pushukago gear in Phaedrus, we know, but we know that the, this mysterious word, Chicago Gain, was used satirically for Socrates in Aristophanes' verse, text two. Chorus of birds sings about Socrates evoking the sword, Chicago Gain, together with his pupil, Chiron. Moreover, the emphasis on love, eros, which is usually believed to characterize Socrates' philosophy, in particular, Ischinus, highlighting this aspect in his dialogues, Ischinus, sophists are not alien to this theme either. Gorgias again discusses the power of Eros as the force factor of coercing Helen to fly to Troy. He means that his own power of speech is re irresistible force and charm like Eros. The fourth point, provocative new idea, ideas. Sophists are usually supposed to engage in social sciences and uh, humanities, but Protagoras, Hippias, and Antiphon also contributed to natural sciences and uh, mathematics. On the other hand, Socrates is also said to have studied natural science when young, uh, if we believe the autographical passage in the video. Sophists and Socrates shared an interest in society, language, and morality as opposed to natural philosophers. While the conversation, uh, conversion um, 
nature and go to human is a hallmark of this era. Protagoras' famous man major thesis may sound similar to human wisdom attributed to Socrates. Sophist advocated many new ideas and many paradoxical theses. Gorgias was especially famous for paradoxologia, as we can see in his extant works. But in this respect, Socrates never got behind Gorgias. He insists, no one does wrong willingly. Being harmed is better than doing harm. Virtues are one. Virtue is knowledge, etc. The so-called Socratic paradoxes. These paradoxes do not stand alone, but have effect as counterargument to some other views or common sense. Provocative or shocking argument were effective means of astonishing, inspiring, and fascinating the audience. Sophist and Socrates entertain similar arguments aiming for similar effects. New ideas, including a critical examination of democracy and religion, were noted um, as possible causes of corrupting youth and traditional culture. The more popular and influential they were, the more dangerous people saw to them. Indeed, Socrates seems more provocative than any other thinkers in cross-examining traditional values and morals, and in this sense, in committing impiety. Here, another contrast may be seen between the primacy of omniscience declared by the sophists and ignorance or disavowal of knowledge assess, asserted by Socrates. But it is doubtful how much people uh, took them at face value. Socrates' famous confession of ignorance must be taken as an irony, hiding his wisdom, or another paradox. The fifth point, uh, Socratic features. I wonder how much left for Socrates alone it is here that Plato started to make efforts to dissociate Socrates from the other sophist. I suggest that the new concept of philosopher, philosophers, philosophers, or philosophy, philosophia, which had a Pythagorean origin, I presume, come to play a crucial role. Plato sees engaged in dialogue as a criterion of a true philosopher, care for the soul and the practice for death now create an essential image of the philosopher. Several other features, including aporia, irony, mimetic method, not taking fees, staying in a native city, etc., may somehow characterize Socrates as philosopher as well. But Plato's new attempt led to the theory of forms, for he defines a philosopher as one who loves to see the truth in the forms in the Republic Book 5. Socrates was thus changed to the philosopher who went out of the cave, saw the real beings, and then returned to the cave at risk of being killed. From the post-Platonic perspective after the fourth century BC, the differences between the philosopher Socrates and the sophists seems correct and obvious. But we can still ask whether there would have been other types of dissociation. My final section, Antiphon and Socrates. Finally, I'd like to focus on one particular sophist and his relation to Socrates, namely Antiphon of Ramnus. Although there is a controversy of the identity or plurality of Antiphon, Antiphons, the Unitarian view, Michael Wagarin, De Grebekaitse, and Laxmost uh, recently, seems stronger now than the separationist view uh, forward by Gerald Pendrick. I'm on the Unitarian side and believe that we can observe Antiphon as one of the important thinkers of the fifth century BC. If this is correct, in addition to being a teacher and a theorist of rhetoric, he was an oligarchic statesman, author of the uh, treatise entitled On Truth and other books, and the sophist whom Xenophon confront with Socrates. Antiphon's rhetorical works, tetralogies, particularly tetralogies, are epideictic uh, pieces that make full use of the Acos argument, supposed to be introduced by Tisias in Sicily a few decades before. The most important fact of Antiphon is that he was an Athenian citizen, a senior of Socrates, 
and the rhetorician and sophist of Athens or in origin. Plato never mentioned his name except a passing reference as an inferior teacher of rhetoric in Menexenos 236a, text 3. So this is the only reference in Plato's Platonic Corpus. A polit uh, the Menexenos is a political and rhetorical dialogue that presents the funeral speech of Athens. So the context is important, I think. It is interesting that Socrates contrasts Aspasia as his teacher with Antiphon. Some commentators, recent commentators like Nick, uh, Nick Papas, suspect that Plato implied Thucydides behind because Antiphon uh, is sometimes said to be the teacher of the Athenian historian. This clear neglect in the whole corpus is an interesting sign of Plato's difficulty of treating this fellow citizen. For Plato defines the sophist as traveling teachers, irresponsible for their influence, as distinct from Socrates as res resident patriot, responsible for genuine education. This fails to fit Antiphon. Also, we perhaps influenced by Plato's dialogue believe that Socrates was the first Athenian native philosopher, but if Antiphon is included in the group of the fifth century sophists, he precedes did Socrates as an active, provocative thinker. His anti-democratic position may look similar to Socrates. Antiphon was tried after the failure of the oligarchic revolution in uh, for 11. He died, uh, sorry, he did not escape Athens and made an impressive defense speech in court to be sentenced to death. The charge was purely political, but we can imagine that for many contemporary Athenians, the trial and ex execution of Socrates was a reminiscent of that of Antiphon in two, 12 years before. While the Arya trial was a nightmare of the abortive revolution, the latter trial became another nightmare of the failure of the restored democracy. To see this, highly praised Antiphon's speech on revolution, and Socrates' speech became a masterpiece in the form of Plato's apology. The reason why we completely ignore Antiphon, a foreigner of Socrates, is that Plato erased him in the history of philosophy and of the sophists. But we have a chapter in Xenophon's Memorabilia, Book 1, Chapter 6, Text 4, which depicts three short conversations between the sophist Antiphon and Socrates. The first scene shows that Antiphon saw Socrates as a rival of his profession and tried to contrast his own sophistic teaching with philosophy. We are facing, uh, okay, so this is near the end of the uh, talk. We are facing the mystery of the gap between the fifth century and the fourth century BC. In order to reconsider Socrates in his context, we should not only look at somewhere outside Plato, but also cross-examine what Plato did for Socrates. Thank you very much. Don, you, you, you're in mute. mute. <laughs> No, I carefully muted myself so um, I wouldn't accidentally interfere with your talk. And now, I'll un now I'm unmuted. Um, uh, so uh, now we can move to the discussion um, part of the event. And um, uh, I invite you to raise your hand, use the raise hand function. Those of you who haven't done it, if you click on participants, you'll get a, a window at the top of your chat. Oops. Um, well, Andre, you've been uh, mentioned by name in the talk and uh, Anytime a person makes a selection of texts, there's an interesting debate to be had about 
what exactly the shape should be, so why don't I invite you to uh, make the first intervention. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> You're in mute, please. Here, you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much to 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 you, Nabaru, and 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 to to Don. Um, I I have three um, points, small points. So. Um, about the the edition and um i'm most grateful about uh the observations uh the more so that um and this is important for us that uh we, we are going to begin to revise the edition um in uh we have actually already begun to do that and the second definitive edition will appear in in 2026 oh. <laughs> so um and we have uh the possibility to revise it as i understand it uh uh with with additions and corrections and so on so we are really free to do that so uh not not, not only your remarks uh Noboru, but everybody's remarks uh, and and you know correction suge suggestions are very welcome in the in the next few years actually um thank you very much for the remark about antiphon and, and socrates i might i must thinking uh, think, think it over um I, I don't remember exactly what moved us to to adopt this um, order but certainly your considerations are are very important um the um i i would like to to make a general remark about you know uh the difference between addition and 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 writing a book about or having ideas about an addition is is necessarily um you know incomplete and in in, in unsatisfactory because it must make choices and these choices can't reflect exactly the subtlety and the um the the, the, the yeah the necessities of 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 of, of comments um antiphon is a is, is a is a good example of uh, we we i don't think that we took stand actually on whether antiphon is one or two um i think to remember that what we said is that we leave that open but of course if we had to include the rest of the antiphon in the log uh, edition that would have changed very much uh, the number of volumes that we uh, should have uh, edited so the idea was really here we leave we we refer to to, to the discourses and uh, you know the, the edition is is by no means meant to be uh, complete and um this this is also true of the socrates chapter where we explicitly said that uh, everybody would have made other choices than the one we uh, we made um because of the material we have i am not convinced that the chronological order would be better but uh, nobaru i will be grateful if we can exchange about that then second remark sophists um the, the 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 title sophist was imposed by the lobe actually for the volumes uh -huh. we wanted something uh like um uh fifth century doctrines about language uh teaching and uh, whatsoever and that was no adequate title for a collection for the lobe library so we resigned and we you know put up with with sophist but obviously there is a contradiction between the title of the volumes and and, and the actual the suggestions and then uh perhaps the most important uh uh, remark which is also linked to the difficulty of making a, an, an edition and about the uh, the title uh, prosocratics hmm. i would bring i would like to bring a, a counter argument with uh, against myself and the whole enterprise um and against you uh, noboru um by saying that in some sense prosocratics is perfectly okay um and not that inadequate and this of course so the decision really that's the important point and 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 the, the, there is no truth on on one side or the other i think 
um, is the question of whether there is something special about Socrates. Well, uh, you brought uh, a number of arguments, which I share, of course, about uh, Socrates not being that special. But if you think about that, uh, about this, the move that, that you, uh, you are making and that we have been making and endorsing consists in simply uh, broadening the point of view from which uh, we consider Socrates. So yes, Socrates is interested in public speech and there are many arguments in favor of that. But then, uh, there is also something special about the kind of uh, public speech that Socrates is promoting. Um, so it, it, really, it, it, it really depends on where you place the uh, specific difference. Um, so it's a question of relationship between uh, genus and, and species, if you want. And uh, of course, from a chronological and from many other points of view, Socrates uh, belonged to the, to, to the so-called sophists. And uh, I agree with everything you say about you know, Plato and so on and so on. But on the, the, on the other side, the, there are good reasons to treat uh, Socrates not uh, chronologically, but, but uh, typologically. And if you think in terms of typology uh, rather than chronology, um, you may go with pre-Socratics, which has its, um, not only its traditional value, but also um, some kind of weight that gets uh, lost if you, um, if you uh, suppress the, the, the designation. Um, so this is not, you know, in, in order to, to assert a position, uh, we must make choices, of course, but, um, but we can't say really that there is no justification to the other side as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh yeah, well, can, can I just uh, reply uh, a few points? Thank you very much, yes, I, 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 I really like your new edition, so uh, my, my comment is very, <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, well, well I, I guess uh, I, I'm using uh, the, the volumes. Oh, and, well, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, and well, the, 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 the designation of pre-Socratic, I, I know, and Andre, you, your book in French, a small book, uh, Defend <laughs> the, the pre-Socratic, the pre-Socratic, and well, and of course, uh, it's, it's, um, it's it's how uh, the, 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 the the difficulties. How much we um, add connotation to pre-Socratic? I mean, Socrates. Uh, as as I discussed today, if we um, assume that Socrates is very special, uh, the only philosopher who studied everything new or something like that, then. The, the pre-Socratic, the title of pre-Socratic is very misleading, I think. But uh, as you said, if we broaden uh, some, some, you know, and, uh, the, the perspective and weakening, uh, weaken uh, the, the, the connotation of pre-Socratics and use it in a general way, maybe it's uh, okay. But today I, I, I focus on the, you know, the, the to, to, to reject our um, prejudice. <laughs> so, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so I just emphasized on the, the opposite side. Just, just to add a, a note, my French book is actually my English book. It has been translated into Thai. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, I know. It was, was thank you. Well, thank you. All right, John Lent. Um, hi, thank you very much. Can you please say something about Aristophanes' clouds? Uh -huh. I, like, I like what you say, and I've always been unsatisfied with Dover's theory. And by the way, I'll just mention, I learned not long ago that that theory did not originate with Dover. It was an older theory in German scholarship. But this idea that it's confused, you know, it seems to clearly show that the Athenians, um, what they thought of Socrates. What, what did, would you say about that? 
Thank you very much. And I didn't discuss the clouds because you know, clouds is, uh, of course, is, uh, as, as Socrates is the main uh, character, so it's uh, uh, much to say about it. But my, my uh, general uh, reading, uh, my, 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 my hypothesis is Aristophanes uh, is, of course, using the character Socrates as a kind of representing the wider uh, you know, uh, images of the mixed some other uh, you know mixed kinds of uh, intellectuals but uh, the, 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 there are a few questions one is why socrates you know why socrates was chosen as a kind of you know uh, that kind of uh, interesting um, character then i i think that there must be some some uh, something <laughs> i mean normally we think that socrates in the the cloud is totally different it's 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 a di distorted one you know we have nothing to see in the uh, clouds i don't think so that there must be something in common uh, in sophist so or the intellectuals that's why aristophanes of course you know exaggerated socrates so then we can uh, and another thing is uh, still uh, the, the interesting mixture between the natural philosophy and the sophistic kinds of you know uh, language and sociological uh, things that is uh, assumed in the uh, the cloud. So uh, this is another uh, assumption uh, after the fourth century that you know natural sciences, uh, physical theories, and uh, uh, morality or ethics are different. I, 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 I think that the cloud is, uh, in a sense, a good hint uh, as to how people are treated these topics in the 5th century BC. And, uh, well, so that is my general <laughs> response. And each part, you know, the, each argument has some background, you know, Diogenes Apollonia or uh, some, you know, other things. So it's, it's interesting to pinpoint, you know, see, <laughs> and I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the class very much. And uh, yeah, Aristophanes is clever, very clever to use, and he understands the theories. <laughs> so I am a bit against the, uh, Kenneth Dover's uh, thesis that uh, the, the work is not philosophical. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, let me just interject. Um, I've noticed this in previous colloquia. Uh, uh, we are a community of good people. And so when we have a group of 50, um, folks are um, quite reticent and don't want to put themselves forward because after all, there are 50 other people uh, who have uh, good questions to ask. Um, and that can lead to um, not a, a shortage of questions. So I encourage you to, um, to put your hand up. I've got one question sent to me by chat from someone with a dysfunctional microphone. Uh, Menachem Luz says to me, um, could you please ask Noburo how he explains the remains of antiphons on truth, as similar to Socrates? Antiphon proposes, if I recall correctly, it had a double ethical standard, the good as relative and the good as conforming to law. Mm. Uh, Okay, thank you. So I didn't discuss uh, uh, either the, the, the Antiphon's treatise the, uh, uh, peri uh, well, on, on truth. Um, we have only a very small portion, uh, I mean the Nomos and Fusis part uh, in uh, Papyrus, so, uh, but I think that is uh, came to us only by chance. So we can, we, I, I don't think we can reconstruct the whole thesis, but the, there have some many interesting, interesting considerations. So I, I, I'm, I'm a bit uh, pessimistic or, uh, or cautious about um, attributing some any, uh, <laughs> any philosophical position to Antiphon, but uh, it's obvious Antiphon discussed a lot of those uh, philosophical issues, uh, pro and contra, probably. Uh, uh, the, the one, one example is the Nomos physis thesis, and we have very strong, um, well, uh, position uh, similar to uh, Graucon or Trosimachus in uh, the Papyrus, but this is only a part of his argument. So we can uh, we cannot uh, say that that is a position of antiform. Uh, so that is my 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 my, my Caution. So is, that, is that enough? Sorry. <laughs> All right, um, David Murphy. 
Hello, Naburo, and thank you for your very valuable paper. And I have two questions, both relating to the Antiphon Socrates scene in Xenophon's Memorabilia 1.6. The first question is, do you think that Xenophon is drifting close to Plato's split between philosophy and sophistry since Antiphon is identified as a sophist and then Antiphon asks Socrates questions about those who engage in philosophy, philosophundus, Yes. You know, most of them become happier, but you don't, and your students don't. So how close is Xenophon coming to a platonic split between those two realms of thinkers? And then my second question is, do you have a view on the date of the memorabilia? Mm -hmm. In particular, do you think it, Xenophon released all the dialogical units together or did they come out piecemeal over the year? Thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the first one, excellent question, uh, uh, well, which I, I should have um, explained uh, more clearly. And uh, you were right, that's, uh, that chapter, uh, book one, ch uh, chapter six, was very close to Plato uh, because the contrast between the philosopher uh, Socrates, uh, who enjoyed free discussion, free dialogue, and uh, the sophist antiphon who take fees uh, to to teach. So that is uh, uh, what I explained as Plato's dissociation. So well, a few possible uh, interpretations. One is Xenophon, uh, in a sense, influenced by uh, was influenced by Plato's distinction. That is my preference uh, because. Uh, Xenophon didn't uh, mention the, uh, in the chapter of Hippias uh, any was sophist. I mean, uh, Xenophon was not consistently uh, contrast to Socrates and other sophists uh, in terms of philosophy and sophists. So uh, that is the only uh, past, uh, chapter uh, in which Xenophon uh, clearly contrasts the philosopher and the sophist. And on the other hand, uh, Xenophon uh, um, in Cunegeticus, Cunegeticus uh, <laughs> on hunting, the last chapter, he criticized sophists. Uh, that uh, people normally uh, assume that is Aristippus, not the fifth century sophist. So um, Xenophon has his own agenda to criticize sophists. And so maybe it's, it's a mixture of the Platonic uh, defense of Socrates as a philosopher, uh, as distinct from so Sophist, and Xenophon's uh, uh, opposition to Aristippus, who was a Sophist. So that is my uh, interpretation. But of, of course, it's, it's open. Uh, maybe Andrew Dorian or other uh, may, may comment on this. Memorabilia, the good, good question. I, I, Imagine that memorabilia, four books, <laughs> not uh, simultaneous publication, you know, the parts by parts. Then the fourth books came probably last. The first book made the first. In that case, the, 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 the uh, chapter six of book one, uh, the Antiphon versus Socrates, belongs to the early part of the publication. But uh, that is, uh, of course, only uh, just well, imagination. Um, but the, thank you for the first point. That is very important. Uh, uh, that is may, that 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 chapter may be against my hypothesis that uh, so Plato was the the the, uh, the the thinker who distinguished clearly between philosophy and uh, sophist uh, among the uh, Socrates pupils. Uh, Xenophon's that passage do the same thing. Thank you. All right, um, uh, Sandra Peterson. Sandra? Yeah. Hi, Sandra. I'm trying to unmute. Can, can you <laughs> You're hear? unmuted. You've, you've yeah. succeeded. Okay, good. Um, I would like to put in a vote for Socrates being special uh, and different from anybody else in that he used his 
questioning, his dialectistai, to get to know people. I don't have all the texts at hand, but I'm thinking in the Theotetus where he says he wants to start talking because it'll help them to get to know each other. And then in the Carmides, he uh, wants to strip Carmides' soul, to undress his soul. And then in Xenophon, Xenophon says that he doesn't know anybody that was so concerned to find out what his companions knew. So that's what I'm thinking is special about Socrates compared to all the other people you've mentioned. So thanks, that's my comment. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, that's uh, probably one of the uh, um, maybe differences, uh, the emphasis or the, the, the intentions. And, um, Socrates, uh, the method, uh, method of di uh, uh, holding a dialogue is, of course, uh, slightly different from other uh, people. So uh, he asks what you think about or that kind of things is probably slightly different from others. So uh, we can say uh, that Socrates has something different from others. Uh, and Plato, uh, later uh, explained or uh, um, characterized as a philosophy. But my, my um, general um, aim is uh, try to avoid uh, a prejudice uh, of this kind of prejudice. Socrates has a good intention and always seeking for truth and so sophists are just fake and you know they deceive people. Uh, they chat uh, for not uh, you know important thing at all. Uh, you know they just uh, persuade people uh, without any knowing uh, knowing any truth. That kind of prejudice, <laughs> I yeah. think, uh, we should avoid. Then carefully we can say what is common uh, and what is different uh, between these people. So your point may be one of the crucial point become one of the crucial point uh, to distinguish between Socrates and the uh, um, uh, sophist. But still, I think that is one of the small differences between doing uh, dialogue or uh, speech speaking activities. That is my so, thank you. Yeah. All right, um, next question, Ross and Weiss. Thank, thank you very much for the wonderful talk, Nabura. Um I was just wondering if it, it wouldn't be accurate to say that Plato is one of our best sources for, um, for recognizing that people in the fifth century uh, didn't see Socrates as different from the sophists. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the one who um, has Socrates say in the Apology that, you know, I'm lumped together with all those who philosophize. So it seems to me that, that Plato is extremely aware of the perception of Socrates as another sophist, as, you know, just one of those intellectuals who do the same thing all intellectuals do. So from my point of view, um, he's, he's, he corroborates your, uh, your sense that, that that was the perception of Socrates at his time. Um, but I, I, think, I think one of the things that, that Plato tries to do for us is to differentiate between how Socrates was perceived and perhaps his self-perception, um, how he thought what he was doing was different from what the sophists were doing and um, how that that self-perception may have been the basis for Plato then distinguishing between, <clears throat> so, so sharply between sophists and uh, philosophers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Rosen. Um, that is a very interesting and important point. Um, of course, uh, one, one possible story is uh, Socrates' lifetime and Socrates and sophist are actually not different and but Plato invented a new distinction that is one story but another story is as you said you know Socrates appears to be very similar in the fifth century but Plato was the only person who detected real difference and he clarified it <laughs> yeah maybe I it's 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 both are possible stories and uh, of course uh uh, I think uh, we have uh, truth in both sides. I, I mean, um, well, um, how, how can I say? Um, my my uh, 
my, my talk today is to just to, uh, to clarify what happened in the fifth century and fourth century. So not only Plato, but other people, and how other people discuss. So still the, the it mystery uh, who Socrates was. <laughs> so probably as you suggested, uh, Plato was right. And Plato was the only person who clearly see differences. So that is a possibility. And uh, of course, we, uh, we, 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 we do philosophy on that basis, you know, the Socrates is a philosopher and uh, uh, sophist. But historically speaking, uh, the, can we say um, all other people than Plato were wrong? That is, of course, very strong claim. And uh, <laughs> And, uh, but yeah, uh, and uh, I, I want to know what, what criterion we can, we can, uh, we, we have to, to, to decide this issue. <laughs> I just yeah. put it uh, on agenda. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think, you know, that, that Plato's point is that people see superficial similarities. They don't mm. go beyond the superficial similarities. And, and superficially speaking, of course, um, Socrates looked like any other intellectual and was lumped mm. together with every other intellectual. Um, you know, we could think about Protagoras in his speech, you know, where he says, oh, everybody was a sophist in disguise. You know, one can't help thinking of that when you, when you try to lump Socrates together with the sophists. And, you know, it, it may be important to, to think about how Socrates saw himself. I mean, first of all, of yes. course, the way he distinguished himself was that he didn't take money for his teaching. That was mm -hmm. the basic mm -hmm. distinction that he drew. Um, but I, I just think it's interesting that maybe Plato was trying to uh, um, expand on Socrates' self-perception, that he did not perceive himself as one of these philosophizers. Yeah, yeah, Socrates' self, um, yes, yeah, self, well, uh, well, kind of identity. I mean, yeah, that's true. Yes. Some, 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 some features which I discussed today is very superficial. Just, just similar, looks similar, yeah. and some are more important. So that uh, we should, we should clearly uh, clarify these differences. Uh, but taking fees, uh, Plato, the, the the only objective criterion between uh, the difference between the sophist and philosopher is taking fee or not taking fee. How much importance uh, it has? That is in interesting because yeah. uh, Socrates, well. Yeah, for example, Aristippus, <laughs> as in the very, very, you know, satirical episode said that, you know, Socrates did the same thing because he got, uh, you know, from friends, you know, food and other things, you know, offered. So why not I take fee? So that is... <laughs> yeah, from my point of view, that's important because it shows what he cares about as opposed to what the sophists cared about. It's not I, I, simply I, that they didn't take a fee. Yes. Um, if I can permit myself to make an intervention, uh, it's long seemed to me that professional philosophers uh, don't have all the equipment that's required to um, answer the sorts of questions you've been asking, Noboro. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me put it this way. It's always seemed to me that Socrates and his companions constituted a distinct community. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Athens. Yes. Uh, you can see this so, for me most vividly in book four when he talks with Euthydemus and the question is whether Euthydemus gets to be in or out of the circle. Um, so uh, what my suggestion is what you need is uh, to look, you need it in part to look at this like a sociologist and say what, what um, uh, what's distinctive about this community and makes it into a community. And that may be values, that may be familiarity, that may be intellectual method. Um, uh, but anyway, it's a sociological question or anthropological question. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah that's a community. Uh, the community doesn't mean that you know, they are very friendly with each other. They share a lot of things, uh, and particularly the memories of Socrates. And, uh, but uh, the, the abuse are so, uh, you know, um, different from each other. So the, I, I assume that they competed with each other uh, to, to, to put different directions. I think, uh, for example, the Aristippus and Antisthenes, Plato and Antisthenes and some other. Uh, but uh, thank you very much. Community and, 
uh, is uh, we, we should think of the, what uh, uh, we think about the community uh, uh, in, in the fourth century BC. Chloe Bala. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, two points. One is sort of a follow up on Don's question. I'm always confused about what we do with the other Socratics. So, Noburu also mentions uh, that Xenophon is thinking of Aristippus in the Kinegeticus. And so, mm -hmm. when is it that the Socratic we are justified to think of him as a sophist? So, I would like to have some comments about that. And the other thing is, um, I was wondering if it would be helpful to, to, to decide whether when we talk about Plato, Socrates, we are thinking that Plato is making a claim about what Socrates thought about himself or whether he is making a character. I mean, it's not a new point, but you know, this literary perspective, is it, does it make sense to say that Plato is making a claim about who Socrates really was? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the, the second point, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's we, we need uh, to, to have some, some consideration about the differences and uh, as a Plato's description or depiction uh, of Socrates as character and what he said uh, in the dialogue. Um, well, uh, Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, do you have any particular dialogue or passage which uh, matters <laughs> on this respect, Chloe? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure what the question is. Uh, well, uh, yeah. You, you, you mean that uh, the, 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 we should distinguish uh, if we should distinguish the uh, what Pl uh, Socrates said in the dialogue and what Plato. Uh, present as a character as a, is there any uh, why we should distinguish these in Plato? No, no, I'm thinking are we thinking of Plato is trying to save Socrates and to talk about who Socrates really was or mm -hmm. is it someone who inspires uh, Plato and uh, acquires a life of his own? Mm -hmm. I mean once we are away I suppose from Vlastos fast and, and, and sharp distinction between the early dialogues being closer to historical Socrates and the others being closer okay. to Plato. Oh. Do we have a criterion to, to say whether this is part of Plato's agenda or whether Plato is acting like a historian of philosophy and talking about Socrates? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult. It's, it's, of course, it's, an, what, what? It's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's a huge question, but uh, because you, you didn't, uh, you didn't in, include the question of the persona in your categories at all. I was just trying to... Yeah, uh, of course, uh, that's come back to my uh, comments on the Lux and Most, uh, uh, you know, the editions, you know, it's a Socrates chapter, uh, which kind of material, what kind of material should be included. My own uh, uh, strategy is uh, not like Brastos, you know, I don't clearly cut the early and the middle dialogue. That's why I uh, cited the, uh, the Republic, uh, the definition of philosophers. If Socrates as philosopher in early dialogue is different from the philosopher in the middle dialogues, uh, that makes uh, things very uh, confusing. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's it's very bad uh, strategy uh, for Plato to to show Socrates in two different types. So, I assume that Socrates in the Apology is, in a sense, the same as Socrates in the Republic. So that is my working hypothesis. But it's, of course, it's not easy to, you know, to connect. <laughs> Sorry, well, that is... Not the historical Socrates, though. Huh? Um, well, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't talk about historical Socrates. Uh, I, 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 more important thing is what Plato believes Socrates, real Socrates to be. So that is my things. Mm. So that maybe it's, 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 it's uh, related to the Rosalind's uh, questions. You know, Plato saw uh, the, the most crucial difference, not superficial uh, similarity, but crucial things. But, but Plato believes uh, Socrates to be, and that is a philosophy. And Graham? All right, I'm, un <coughs> excuse me, I'm muted here. 
Um, this is inspired a bit by Don's comment. I thought he was going in this direction, but he did talk about sort of a more anthropological view here. And this is the one, at least this is what I want to push a little farther. It seems to me that one of the most basic distinctions between Socrates and the so-called sophists is something having to do with uh, how important, well, a way of life. Um, for Socrates, it seems that philosophy is a way of life. And that's why he constantly talks about um, trying to, <clears throat> uh, about the soul and, you know, examining people's souls and examining your soul, making it better. Um, and when you get somebody uh, saying that, you know, for instance, we have a confront the antiphon confrontation that's about, uh, is this going to make you richer? Is it going to make you more successful in worldly terms? That's not what Socrates is all about. He's wanting to know, is it going to make you a better human being? Is it going to make you, uh, you know, make your life more complete? It's more like a religious conception for Socrates in the sense that this is you know, total commitment. As you see, when Socrates risks his life for his philosophy, um, and I think a number of times, not just in the trial, his trial, uh, but we have other examples, the trial of the generals and so on, and in uh, the confrontation with the 30 tyrants when he refuses to arrest Leon of Salamis and so on. There's this kind of complete commitment here to, to a way of life, not just a profession. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, of course, um, um, Socrates, uh, the, the uh, activities uh, of life uh, is always uh, the concern is uh, what life uh, or you know, good life uh, you know, uh, uh, Eusen and uh, care for the souls, and uh, still, um, what I was uh, talking about is uh, we cannot simply say that Socrates was a philosopher who care for the uh, who provides a way of life, who, who discusses way of life, and so uh, while the sophists are quite different, sophists. For example, Protagoras, uh, when he teaches uh, virtues, uh, he was serious. I, 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 for example, I can, I can discuss, uh, I can argue, you know, Protagoras was a serious educator uh, who really want society make better, uh, become better, uh, or, uh, or, well, Antiphon. Uh, Antiphon was a rhetorical teacher, but actually he committed his, uh, you know, political life um, in, in the last of his life, you know, as an oligarchic government, and uh, it's it's more active than Socrates, so it's 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 not so easy uh, to, to 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 separate, <laughs> distinguish Socrates uh, as a kind of the philosopher and from the other sophists. So my, 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 it's of course, yeah, we have some differences. Uh, we see some differences. So I don't deny uh, Socrates is some, have some special uh, or many special things, but still uh, we cannot uh, say it categorically Socrates is different from sophists. That is my, my working hypothesis. Thank you. Noboro, I have a question um, through chat from Josef Lieberson. I'm going to paraphrase, um, hope I get it roughly right. Um, uh, in the apology, you've got a context where there's a speaker and an audience. Um, and so Socrates makes this distinction between a philosopher and others, including sophists. Um, uh, how do we suppose the audience receives that as something they've never heard of before, as something that um, uh, is well understood by them and hence in the culture, especially if you're thinking of this as a quasi-historical representation, um, um, that makes a difference to uh, when 
this distinction came about and how. Uh, you, you mean Plato's Apology? Um, In Plato's Apology, the, uh, what did this come across, do you think, as new to the audience or as something familiar already? I, um, it's interesting. Uh, as, uh, as far as I, uh, I, I see, that is uh, not a uh, very much accepted view, <laughs> I mean, distinction. So the, even, if, even if the Socrates uh, did that speech in actual court, uh, people didn't, uh, didn't uh, wouldn't understand, you know, the why Socrates said that kind of things. For example, he was not sophist because he doesn't take uh, fees. Okay, but you did the same thing. Uh, so that kind of things, and so uh, the the question is, of course, that uh, Socrates, as a historical Socrates, had that distinction, or Plato invented that distinction. That is very difficult to say. But Plato saw uh, Socrates, the essence of Socrates, as uh, in, uh, in in that way. So that uh, that, that is, uh, as far as I can say, uh, that is uh, that is true. I mean, Plato believes that Socrates was uh, that kind of person. And, uh, but uh, you can say, uh, we cannot say that in the fifth century BC, the, the contemporary uh, Athenians uh, see any distinction, even if uh, Socrates claimed was that kind of thing. So the, it's, it's very complicated <laughs> things and how to, how to read that passage in the apology. Well, thank you, Nabooru and everyone. Um, our next colloquium is in two weeks, but on Tuesday, November, uh, September 15th, Paul Woodruff will speak on In Socrates' Footsteps, A Better Model for Virtue Ethics. Um, his talk is going to be quite philosophical rather than uh, historical. His question is, what kind of virtue ethics do you get out of Socrates, for example, as contrasted with Plato and Aristotle? So if you're interested in a, particularly in the philosophical inspiration that can come from Socrates, um, Paul's talk should be of interest to you. Um, uh, thank you all for coming and um, see you in future colloquia. Thank you. Thank you.